close enough. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, I'm really glad you guys all figured out what room uh, this was going to be in. I went to the wrong one twice, so, uh, so I'm, I'm glad you could make it. Um, this is a great sub subject for me. I really like it, and hopefully uh, I can kind of share some of the things that we're doing with some current customers, some current projects, and also just some really – there's a lot of really um, – uh, great people that are working on this project. So anything I can do to help, I'm really, really pleased. I'm glad you guys are interested in this. All right, that's me. Um, I have one of the best jobs in the world. I'm a field engineer for a company called Neo4j. We're a 17-year-old startup from Sweden, and um, we are the world's leading graph database company. My job is to pretty much go around to companies that are working on really interesting projects, really complex situations. Um, I have the greatest job. I really I get to travel all over. I was, last week at this time I was in Rio uh, on company business. So I really I love my job, and I love helping people understand how to um, how to make this stuff work. Okay. Uh, for those of you, because this is a college, I'm going to give you the short version. So uh, the TLDR on this is basically. Your key takeaways, use graphs whenever whenever I'm, this isn't working well, but that's good enough. Okay, this is why you use graph databases for solving really interesting kind of problems where you've got a lot of complexity in your data. Like there was a gentleman, the last presentation, how many of you saw that presentation on um, uh, healthcare data? So healthcare data is extremely complex. And so now you're adding a law enforcement dimension to it, plus you also have patient information, you have HIPAA requirements. So you have very complex relationships. So this is really a good use case for graphs. Um, the uh, requirements change a lot, so it's not very rigid. You keep doing, you keep changing things as, as you need to. Um, your data is requiring context. So like if you're trying to do machine learning, you're trying to add context to what you're trying to do, you're trying to make more informed decisions. But, but more importantly, the last line there, really, that's why you come. So any database can tell you what happened. Every database in the world is a great log for recording what's happened. People use graphs for really sophisticated use cases when they're trying to predict what's going to happen, prevent something from happening, or influence what's going to happen. So we work with banks who don't want people like stealing from them. We, look, we work with a lot of media companies for um, recommending things, recommending uh, stuff, movies, TV shows, songs, hotel rooms, vacations, air, airplane flights, that kind of stuff. So really, your, your takeaway for graphs is you use them when you're trying to influence behavior. You're trying to do something a little more sophisticated than what a basic graph data, what a basic database would do. And that really describes opioid data. It's, it's highly complex data. They're, you're working with a lot of different data sources, and you're working with some pretty interesting challenges. So that's your uh, takeaway. If you get nothing else out of this presentation, um, you'll learn that it's really a pretty good use for that. Okay, uh, but I am an employee, so we got a word from our sponsor. <laughs> All right, um, connected data, that's why graphs are there. So graphs, being able to connect things, put, putting your data in context. So you're not just doing simple machine learning, you're not doing k-means testing against certain kind of variables without understanding why. So graphs are really good for putting data into context. So being able to do that, that's a real value driver for a lot of companies. Because you have situations where it used to be you had a few things that you were keeping track of, but now in, in most enterprises you've got all kinds of things. You're adding new data sources on the fly all the time. So being able to respond quickly to changes or being able to sp respond to legislation or changing the things in the marketplace, but being able to change to new things with legislation regarding opioids. So this is really a good s basis for this because opioid data is pretty complex. But basically, healthcare data is coming from all over the place. It's, you've got research stuff that's going on. You've got uh, patient information. Uh, you've got it's an organization. You've got people. You've got security issues. You have uh, you have addictions. You have money. There's a lot of money involved in it. So you've got very very complex relationships between the data. So this is really a good situation when graphs take over because relational databases just can't handle it. So being able to do things because it's highly connected. And reliability is paramount. So this is being able to trust the data that's out there, um, being able to trust what, what prescriptions people have had before you start giving out more, being able to find out what kind of treatments they've had. 
Um, constantly changing environment is really critical, being able to respond to that. If you've got the same stable stuff over and over again, pick Oracle, do anything you want. But, but graphs are really good for when you've got a lot of change going on. Um, you've got data that's subject to waste and fraud. So uh, this is a really good thing because our number one paying customer are the banks. We moved our annual conference to Wall Street because financial security is you know, being able to fight cyber, cyber crime and being able to solve that kind of problem is, uh, is our number one use case. A couple of other things. We're going to steal a lot of these ideas from uh, financial crimes and cybersecurity. This is what we get used a lot for. But being able to, again, predict and influence things. So the common theme throughout these use cases is being able to influence people's behavior. Not just record what did happen, but basically what you want to happen. You're trying to, you're trying to get people to either do things or, more importantly, stop doing things. So stop stealing from you. Stop selling drugs to people that, sh well, it's a long story. <laughs> OK, a couple of things on this slide. Just the last one for the, for the marketing thing. Um, I love this slide because a few things. We get to work with a lot of really cool companies, but I won't say their name. It rhymes with Microsoft. Um, they're one of our biggest customers. They use our software because we're really good. They use us for, their, for managing their Azure network. They use us for managing their uh, cyber crime. So a lot of cybersecurity stuff. Because when, you're, when your biggest customer or when your biggest competitor is also your customer, it's pretty good. It's so another one that's not up there, but I thought about it a lot when I was flying to over the Amazon River and I was looking at the Amazon jungle. Uh, I can't say them, but anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was thinking about them a lot. So, okay. And more importantly for you guys, why is this important? So, you have this thing here, this red line at the bottom. This is a regular database like Oracle, MySQL, that type of thing. It's a relational databases. But the green line is a new trend. This is graph databases. Um, so it's kind of like understanding how Oracle and MySQL works. That's kind of like entry stakes. So it's anteing up and playing poker. But a winning hand is something that's a little more, got some, got some legs to it as far as uh, like skills that are in demand. And I routinely run into people probably several times a week with saying, this is great. I can't find people that know how to do this. How can I get, fortunately, my job is to train people how to do this. So it's really pretty easy to learn, but it's, it's quite lucrative. So you might uh, think about it. All right, last thing, who's heard of Meryl Streep? Okay, this is, this is USC. Who's heard of the Panama Papers? Most, so some of you have, haven't you? So this is great. They just announced this a little while ago. So Meryl Streep is in a movie about the Panama Papers. It's called The Laundromat, because it's about money laundering. Get it? So anyway, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so you, it's Meryl Streep, Antonio Banderas, uh, directed by Steven Soderbergh. It should be pretty good. Um, so NEO was an instrumental role in that. So I'm going to show some of the things that we used for solving those problems. And we put people in jail. So it worked out really pretty well. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll show you how that, what, what's going on with that. But yeah, uh, look for this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping we get to go to Venice for the d debut, but probably not. But uh, anyway, it should be good. So look for it. Yeah, Meryl Streep. Um. OK, here we go. There's so much information about the opioid epidemic, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Otherwise, I'm just going to be reciting statistics, that kind of thing. Um, just in general, it's, it's a horrible problem. It's killing a lot of people. It goes throughout our society. Uh, 130 people a day are dying from it. Um, that's an old statistic. It's gone up like that since then. Um, it hits every income group. It hits every, um, every demographic you can think of. It's all over the place. So that's why I, I like working with some of the healthcare providers that we're working with in terms of helping to figure this out because in rural America, they're really starved for a lot of resources. So, and this stuff is so easy to use and a lot of the data is publicly available. So anyway, so, um, but it's a, it's a huge problem, but at the bottom, it's really, it's a people problem. And I can't solve that, but I can sure figure out the law enforcement stuff. So being able to figure out who are, the, who are the doctors that are working together, colluding with pharmacies in order to sell millions of dollars worth of pills to people that, I mean, we had one doctor we found, this, this guy, he actually had eight patients die, and he was still prescribing pills until somebody figured out, oh, go connect the dots. So that's what NEO does. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so that's what NEO does. We connect the dots. So. Um, Okay, so it's, it's basically, it's, it's a nationwide problem, but primarily in rural areas because 
Uh, well, well, a lot of reasons why it's in rural areas, but um, I won't go into a lot of statistics on there, but you can see what, what's going on. Okay, um, so when it started, it was a lot of it had to do with oxycontin and oxycodone, hydrocodone, and the variations on that. Uh, Purdue Pharma, they came out with this thing. They spent a lot of money telling doctors, oh, by the way, it's not habit forming. There's no problems giving this out to people. And as late as 2018, they were still doing that. They're still pushing this stuff out to, um, to uh, providers. So it's cheap and easy to obtain. This is an actual screenshot from GoodRx from last week. Uh, 30 bucks to get um, 180 pills. So if you can get five fake IDs and you can get a whole bunch of these things and you walk in there, you don't, there's no ID required to get a prescription filled at one of these things in internet pharmacies. So being able to figure out where these things are being filled. But, but Oxycontin is really, it's, it's what's in the news because there's a lot of stuff about the number of pills that are out there. But it's really not what's, what's going on. So Oxycontin is basically this line here, it's the, uh, the purple. It's, uh, po po it's the most prescribed pill, but uh, things really changed back in here once they started cracking down on Oxycontin. It's like a water balloon. You squeeze it in one area, it pops out somewhere else. So what ended up going on was the rise of heroin. So heroin was pretty popular. But heroin has a lot of really other awful side effects, people dying of intravenous drug users, sharing needles, uh, uh, rise in hepatitis C. Uh, and that type of thing. So being able to look for those markers in your community to see what's going on. And, uh, and people weren't really looking for the side effects of cr clamping down here without addressing the problem over here. But the biggie is that black line there. So that's uh, fentanyl. And fentanyl is um, not too much in the news, except that's what killed Prince. That's what killed, um, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Tom Petty. Uh, a lot of people are dying from that where they didn't know that they were getting pills. They thought they were getting just regular oxycontin pills, but somebody gave it a little boost with uh, fentanyl. So fentanyl is really, it's, 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 real, it's a big scourge, but it's so easy to get in. And, and like the other one up here that mentions, you can't see the text, it says tramadol. My dog used to get tramadol, and they always looked at me funny when I was getting prescriptions refilled. But it's like super cheap, super easy. My dog would walk around just stoned out of her mind, and we didn't know what, what the deal was. But it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty, pretty disastrous. So this, this is a fatal dose of heroin, and look at this. That's a fatal dose of fentanyl. That's like 10 grains of salt that'll kill you. It's unbelievably powerful. So if you're going to try to smuggle in kilos of this stuff here, or smuggle in a golf ball size thing of this. You can kill a lot of people with a golf ball, but you can make a ton of money. So, so that's kind of where the trend is going, is more in fentanyl uh, distribution. But right now the big focus is on the drugs and the suppliers, because that's what got us into this mess. But that's not really where the problem is going to continue to be. So be on the lookout for more fentanyl related things. Um, OK, so that's my overview of the problem itself. So now I kind of want to get into how we, how we can solve that. First off. What's a graph? These aren't really graphs. These are, to us, these are charts. These are graphs. A graph is a mathematical representation of things that are related to one another and the properties that they have. How are they related to one another? So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about graph databases. Not a graphical database. Graphics are the representation of that. Yeah, it's usually a nice picture you look at. So that's the first clue that when you're interviewing somebody, you say, I love graphical databases, they're like, so that's, that's, that one's free. You can have that one. <laughs> okay, so graph components are really, really simple. It's like, uh, like constructing things in English. You have a couple of things. We call them nodes. But basically what they are, they're your nouns. They represent objects, persons, places, things, objects, ideas. It could be anything you want. It could be a credit card number. It could be a person. It could be a car. It could be a class. It could be a presentation. It could be anything. Um, in and of itself, it has a few key value pairs that uh, are keeping track of the properties. But more important to us are the relationships between these things. Um, we want to know not just that there is a foreign key relationship to, between these two things here, but I want to know why. How are they related? I might have thousands of reasons these things are related to one another, and I want to be able to test out certain ones at any given time. So having flexibility in how your relationships are defined. So again, if you have data that's highly connected and you value why does somebody know that, it's like, okay, this person knows this person. How? Are they married? Are they divorced? Are, is that his lawyer? Are they business partners? Did he sell him? Did he steal from him? Did he try to kill him? These are all really very different reasons. Well, 
not always, but um, you know they're. Uh, you know, there are uh, very important reasons for understanding why you're doing that. So the properties themselves th for the relationships are really important. And for each of these sets, you get key value pairs. They're, they're flexible. You can add new ones on the fly. There's no schema changes required. I'd say, I've got a new key value pair because a new legislation just came in. I've got new things that I have to do. And this is be being able to change these things on the fly is what makes graphs fly. That's why people like us for that type of thing. So this picture isn't much. I've got some nouns, I've got some verbs, I've got some adjectives to describe the nouns, and I've got some adverbs to describe the relationships between them. So it's really pretty simple. Um, but with those four things, you can build some really cool English statements. Well, you can do a lot of cool things in the graph. So each little piece of information isn't much. Um, this is intentionally blurry because this is real data. This is from a company that is like trying to decide really fast, should I approve this money transfer? And they've got like seven milliseconds to decide. It's, it's doing over 3,000 joins. The time, but this is a particular person that's color coded for the kinds of IDs that they have, the credit card purchases that they've made, the places that they've been, the, the site websites that they've been to, the loans that they've taken out, all kinds of. I mean, there's so much data that's out there that companies are using against you. Um, but this type way, we can actually get to use it for good. So, so I'm okay with that. Okay, so but each piece of information is pretty small. It's a noun connected to a, a, a verb. So each piece of information really isn't much. But when you start Getting all of those together, you it starts drawing a real picture. So I, I like this. It draws kind of a picture. Each one doesn't give you much. But if you step back and you say, I've got 3,000 pieces of information about that person. I've got a pretty good idea what they're going to do, what they're going to do next. And here's how I can stop them. So this is a pretty useful way for, again, for influencing the future. You're not trying to just keep track of what somebody's done in the past. That's useful, but, but it's, it's much more desirable to figure out what they're kind of trying to do because you're trying to prevent it. OK, so how can graphs help? So we've got a lot of things that we um, have, things, toolkits, or things in our toolkit that we can use for figuring out um, what's the best way to do it. So we stole, we stole a lot of ideas from the financial crime uh, community. So we're all, always trying to look for I identifying fraudulent behaviors, which is basically pattern matching. You're trying to look for patterns that are in there. Uh, identifying crime rings. Um, this is a biggie. Identifying people correctly, Identi identity uh, resolution and disambiguation is a huge thing, not just for the medical community, but it's like keeping track. So I don't have a record for Mark Quinlan, and I have Hertz. Hertz drives me nuts. I have Mark Quinlan and Mark A Quinlan, and it's like really, um, can you guys like get my stuff done because you gave the car to the wrong me, um, kind of thing. So being able to figure out that kind of stuff from a business standpoint is really important. Um, customer 360, where you're trying to get everything about a person. So we're stealing a lot of those things and turning it into opioid 360 or customer or patient 360. So this is a common thing. So you're trying to get a complete view of patients, but also you're trying to get a complete view of the providers because they're the kind of the ones that, that are in the middle here. They've got a real important role to play. And social networks. So LinkedIn is nothing but a huge graph. LinkedIn actually uses us for a lot of stuff. So. Um, we are, again, we're, we're a graph company because we're trying to build these social networking graphs for people. So you steal a lot of ideas from them um, to really to identify statistical anomalies. So like in the Panama Papers, it's, it's like, okay, if you, have, if you have, how many of you have more than 1,000 Twitter followers? Okay, how many of you have more than 75,000? Okay, so most people don't. And if you were to start, go from zero, Two, three, that means you got your mom and a couple of other people to follow you. Okay, but if you go from zero to 75,000 in less than an hour, chances are you're not working with a real person. So that kind of thing, being able to figure out timing for these things. So you not only how many do you have, but how did you come to get them? Those are really important things for finding anomalies because you're trying to find bad people, and there's plenty of them. Okay, and also we get used a lot for, we're gonna borrow some techniques from graph enhanced AI and machine learning. There's a lot of there's a lot of complementary technology here we use a lot for making essentially making your machine learning and AI processes run smoother and being able to put them in context. So we'll talk about some of those things that are being used there. Okay, a um, couple of things like who are today's fraudsters? Generally, they're operating in groups. Uh, they create synthetic identities or they steal identities. So identity management is really critical for this. 
I mean, we all know that for 50 bucks you can go downtown and get a fake social security number. But chances are it's a real social security number that several people are using. So being able to keep track of identities is really important, which is why people spend a fortune trying to track you on your web so that your credit card, it's like I can figure out what you're doing. Actually, if you let us look at your email for a couple of minutes, I can probably figure out more than you suspect. So it's really, an, it's from a security standpoint, that's, that's a different topic. But, but pe be aware that people are watching you and you have criminals that are watching you trying to figure out as much as they can so they can steal your IDs because it's a lot easier to walk in with something with a real ID and get a bunch of prescriptions for it. So, um, so these kinds of things, like most tech detection techniques are really good at finding out the outliers out there. I mean, that's really simple. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to use something more sophisticated and use something like this to where, like, okay, this person here, he's working with these five people. Any one of the five seems perfectly normal, but taken together, that's an anomaly. So I wanna, what I want to do is I want to figure out how do I put these people together? How do I link them together? So that's where graphs come in, and you come up with much better analysis for that. So it's pretty common. A couple of other things we do. So you model a fraud ring as a graph, and you start seeing things like, it's like I start seeing attributes, like this is a social security number. In a regular database, that would be an attribute of that person. But in the graph, it's typically, oh, no, it's a thing in and of itself because we want to see how many people reuse that. Um, phone numbers, the same kind of thing. Um, OK, um, how many of you um, know this song, 8675309? All right. So, OK, no, Nate, sorry, you're going to get an earworm. It's not going to come out. So anyway, you go into, if you go into Ralph's, Kroger's, anybody that uses a thing where you need a discount code or go to buy Gasly, Type in your area code at 8675309, and you get a discount. It's really kind of cool. Well, it screws up their database wildly, but it's so that's another freebie. So that's worth <laughs> worth the price of it. I, I save a lot of money on gasoline that way, <laughs> so it is useful. But but be aware that people are reusing these IDs, this kind of identity. So just because something matches, you still have to do other things for it. So but w so you're trying to see if, like how are these people working together? And this is actually a highly simplified management style. Um, uh, presentation, but this is what uh, most of the world's leading banks use us for, is being able to catch these kind of things on the fly. So well basically what you're doing is you're trying to augment your, your fraud detection by, you have basic stuff like endpoint analysis, which is what most people do, and you kind of work your way across all the way to be able to link these things together and put these people in context. So I have this social security number that's been used several hundred times. Okay, that's, that's an interesting thing. So being able to link together, how many are people using a common, common um, anything? We had a nice little fraud ring that was broken up in Seattle because real estate agents are like, they're not exactly high tech. Okay, so they, so they were, so they had gone to all the trouble of creating all these fake IDs. They were reusing the same fax number because real estate companies still fax things back and forth. So really what tripped up a multi-million dollar fraud ring was a fax machine. So, uh, <laughs> so I mean, really, I mean, most of the time you're catching people because they're stupid. I mean, anybody from law enforcement can tell you that the smart ones get away with it. But there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, so they go after them first. So just go for the stupid people. I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay, so but here's where it starts affecting things in healthcare. So I, I love this sentence. I was uh, uh, this 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 article came out the day after I was at a regional healthcare provider, and uh, we were talking about entity resolution. But like you know, patient being harmed. You know, that's underlined for a reason because they couldn't figure out who this person was. I mean, when somebody comes in and says, "Hi, I'm Joe," and then they. They, their insurance changes and they come in a little bit later. Hi, I'm Joseph. And it's like they don't make the connection. But this guy here is allergic to a whole bunch of things that they just gave him. Here, this is a real problem. It happens a lot. Happens, um, you know, a lot of times. Um, so here we go. Like they said, 9% of transactions were misidentified. I mean, that's serious business. A lot of people are, can get hurt on that. Um, and all of these, uh, you can download the paper after, you're, you're after I'm done. All of these have links for where, where I got this stuff. So if you want to follow up on any of this, you're, you're welcome to. I hope you do. So anyway, so how do you use, how do you borrow some of the things from financial services to reapply? Well, basically, you're looking for name variations. You're looking for geospatial proximity. So if somebody says, hey, I'm, uh, they might add a fake ad apartment number to their house. And that's some do those simple string match, which is what confuses a lot of database systems. But we do everything as an address. We, we know the latitude and longitude. I can tell you that that address is within five feet of that other address. You know, it's kind of 
kind of, uh, kind of an important thing. You're looking for behaviors that are in common. So like this is a real thing. I changed the name. But I've got John Smith, John Edward Smith, J. Edward Smith, John E. Smith, J. Edward Smith, and Edward Smith. That's all. OK, those are six different people. Actually, this is from a real example. Six different people with real six different DEA numbers. So they actually can be six. So it's like this guy here, he's under the limit. He's under the limit. He's under the limit. But collectively, they're not under the limit. But they all went to the same big state medical school. They all share the same phone number. They all have the same address or within 50 feet of the address. They all have admitting privileges to the same hospital. And they all have the same uh, NPI number, which is uh, from, the, uh, uh, from Medicare. So anyway, being able to create links between these things using graphs is really um, so what we do all day long, but we typically do it for less important things. So I really, um, I'm really happy to be working on this part of it. Um, here's an example of uh, some Jupyter. Uh, it's a Python notebook that I created for showing how to do this identity uh, disambiguation. It's really pretty simple. Um, and that's really where I started on was like, hey, here's how to do this. And it was kind of like to help Walmart sell potato chips. But um, it wasn't really as much fun as being able to say, hey, look, doctors, I can figure out how to help your healthcare thing. So this project kind of morphed from this initial set of slides to doing the opioid stuff. But, but it's super easy to do because graphs make it really easy to do. Because again, a lot of times a bank will come up and say, hey, can you guys do these kind of queries? You have seven milliseconds to do all of these joins because I need the answer back quickly. So um, I'll post the, the Python notebooks that are out there. It's stupidly simple. OK, so, um, and then I, when I was doing some research, I, had, I started writing up all of these things and really cool ideas and stuff. And then I found out, hey, cool, I'm, I was beat to the punch by some guys from Park. So I don't know if you know Palo Alto Research Center. They, they're kind of important in the computer world. They've been doing some stuff for a little while. But funny thing is, they're owned by Xerox. And because the stuff they did didn't look like copiers, they kind of like were ignored by their company. Anyway, long story. but. Um, so they did this thing on being able to do graph type queries. And I love this quote in here. They were the first of their kind that allowed to do this because it detecting network-based fraud was not previously possible. Earlier systems we just weren't able to do it. So the technology has really improved a lot for being able to do this. Now you can do this very quickly. This is a community graph. This is basically showing the, um, how these doctors are organized in the community. We frequently do this for feature extraction. Say, hey, are you in this group? Oops, sorry, press the wrong button. We'll get there. OK, so this is a community uh, detection thing. I like this one here, because they spotted out this pharmacy here was identified as an outlier. It's like 42% of their patients live more than 500 miles away. It's like, huh. So what they're doing was they're taking these planes. They used to actually call the Oxy Express. And they would basically pay people to go get on these flights to go down there to these friendly pharmacies that would go look the other way while they're filling out all these things that were killing communities in Appalachia. But um, so yeah, it's a true story about a lot of people flying down from Appalachia to uh, Miami for that purpose. Um, OK, graph algorithms. So here's how we're using graph algorithms. So it's kind of nice because. It's a graph database. It's not a row SQL database. It's a graph. So because it's a graph, you've got really cool math graph theory behind you. You can do a lot of stuff. And that's free. It's like, wow, it's, it's there. I already have data organized in the way I need. So you start running some graph algorithms to do it. Um, how, typically, how people are using graph algorithms, they're doing like path analysis. So network path analysis, like where should this package go for DHL? Where should it go next? That, that kind of stuff. But paths are also. Think of a patient's journey. That's a pathway there. So you can apply the same kind of analytics to this pathway to see, hey, where are my, where are my variations? That type of thing. So a lot we have healthcare uh, companies that use us for providing uh, patient journey stuff for like the VA hospital. So they're just trying to use path analysis techniques for that. Uh, centrality, we're going to focus more on that today because that's important. That's figuring out who is this person and why are they statistically important? Who should I focus my efforts on? So it's, it's basically determining the importance of somebody in the, in the room. Um, community detection is figuring out how do I subset my graph? How do I partition it? So it's basically, what are my feature sets that I'm looking for? And how do I organize these people for doing, are they going to behave this way? Are they going to behave this way? Are they going to behave this way? So those are the most commonly used one. And um, they've got a slide coming up. So we've got a free book that's uh, one of our uh, really brilliant um, uh, 
uh, uh, PhDs just finished writing, so it's, it's really pretty good on how to do this. Okay, how many of you remember Yahoo? <laughs> okay, Alta Vista. That's kind of okay. Alta Vista. So, so Alta Vista kind of died when Google came along. They were both search engines, but the thing that made Google work really well was like, hey, there's a million things that meet your criteria, and Alta Vista would say, and here they are at random, and Google would say. Uh, you know what, I'm going to give you the ones that are statistically most interesting for you. So essentially, every time it printed, presented results, it was effectively recommending things to you. So that's graph theory, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create recommendations. So in this thing here, the yellow dot is significant because you've only got a few things pointing to it, but the ones that are pointing to it are important. So essentially, you are a result of the importance of the people that are connected to you. So it's using these connections to figure this out. So it's really a stupidly simple algorithm to figure this out. You just run through the data a whole bunch of times to see how things are being used. A bunch of different algorithms. So this is the most commonly used one for figuring out who's important in this network. So you can find things. But it's used a lot for a lot of things because you, anytime you have, you're presenting search results, you should be doing some kind of recommendation so that people, so you present things like, hey, don't just go find the, um, the 20 PowerPoint slides that are out there. Um, go find me the ones that my boss liked or that, my, or that this team over here helped create where they've got a lot of likes. So that's how Airbnb uses us for that, for that purpose. Okay, another one is betweenness centrality. So betweenness is figuring out who is this node here, this node here. These are the go-betweens. In a classic network like for Cisco or for uh, Microsoft, this would be, these are my single points of failure. This is what, if this thing goes down, what goes on? But in a crime network or opioid distribution, this is the guy, he doesn't get his fingers dirty. He doesn't know too many people, but he connects groups. Hey, I got some friends, they're over here. They can make you some money kind of thing. So finding these guys here is like finding a needle in a haystack, but that's a really valuable needle to find. So, so again, you're trying to prevent, so like if I were trying to do a, a banking network or something like that, I would want to find these things so I can harden those, make sure that those things aren't going to be going down. But in a crime network, I'm looking for those because they are well connected. The other group of people are this red dot. These are the busybodies. They know everybody, but that's like more like a local dealer. He knows everybody in his little area. But, so that's... Unfortunately, this is where law enforcement frequently tends to focus its efforts because this is the low-hanging fruit. It's the easiest ones. These are the guys on the street. They're the ones that like, show up in the poorest neighborhood in town driving the newest Tesla. Uh, it's like, okay, uh, you know, with baggies in the back seat kind of thing. That's, that's not, but these guys here, graphs finding those guys there, that's really cool because now you're taking down people that are killing lots of people. So being able to do that. So those, so our, our, our algorithms are basically how important is somebody um, and strategically where are they in the network and being able to figure out how, how connected they are. So there's a bunch of different algorithms for doing that. And it's basically you just turn on one line of code and say, hey, go find these things for me. And it chugs and chugs and chugs and comes back with an answer. It'll tell you how, the, how these things are. And again, the, the lines of code for doing this are really pretty simple. So I, I wanted to simplify things, so here we go. I actually have never seen this show, I will, I will admit this. Um, but I understand there's some really weird relationships between people <laughs> in here, and I'll kind of leave it at that. So, so um, basically what you have going here is you have the node size. That's how important they are. Um, I'm guessing that's correct. Uh, <laughs> you know, but those, and I don't even know what season this is based on. So anyway, um, I'm sure that, that you know, like killing somebody should be a, like a really important relationship that would make it kind of wide. So basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to, how big is the graph? How big should it be? Uh, or how big is the node? Like just to show its importance. Because otherwise, this is going to come from pages and pages and pages of data. But being able to sh visualize it like this and say, hey, the color. So this is a, be using a basic uh, community detection called Louvain. Uh, it's really, it's, it's, again, it's really simple to run. So you run the, this thing through here. Relationship size is the weight of the relationship. Weights are typically calculated based on properties. Like, you know, if you married somebody that you get, so many points. If you kill somebody, you get more points. That kind of kind of thing. So being able to calculate, be, but being able to change the relationships on the fly for, hey, I want to look for this. I want to test for this. I want to test for this. But being able to do this quickly. Okay, this is a nice simple example, but it usually doesn't look that way. It's usually more like this. So being able to now spot the ones that are like, okay. So being able to do statistically, but being able to calculate this in less than a second. Being able to figure out who's important and who's not. This is kind of cool. So be, the, this is real data, which is why you can't see anything. 
Um, but yeah, this is pretty. Um, this is pretty useful for being able to calculate these things. So you, there's some real obvious ones, but if you thought that these guys were the only important ones, then you're not paying attention. So anyway, statistically, it's pretty easy to do. We have examples of how to run these queries. They're out there, and I've got some links to those in a minute. What are we doing on time? Oh, I've got to talk faster. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'm going to skip this slide here and this one here. This is an important one. Uh, download this book. But um, uh, again, download the slides. Okay. Um, healthcare use cases. Again, uh, customer data is all over the place. You're, you've got a lot of stuff that, that's involved there. Uh, being able to track a patient's journey, being able to figure out when did they start doing something? Oh, what doctor did they see first? Oh, this is the doctor that started the whole process going, started sending them to his friends. So being able to do path analytics like this. This is, again, this is also fuzzy because that's real data going out there. So the Panama Papers, uh, real quick, why we use a lot of the same techniques, but this is basically a lot of stolen data from a law firm that um, we put a lot of people in jail because we helped them figure out what the relationships between them. Uh, they won the Pulitzer Prize for it. Um, we put some people, some, we made life uncomfortable for some really important people, but more importantly, they're friends. I mean, nobody walks into somebody's office anymore and says, here's a million dollars. I want you to start cheating, you know, vote for me this way. It's like, my son will buy a condo from your son for $5 million extra, and the extra money is your finder's fee. So that stuff happens a lot. So here's uh, one of the families in Azerbaijan that we kind of uh, were able to track down. But um, these kinds of relationships between them are really pretty simple to figure out in a graph. And you can even do these in Excel. But when they look like this, you really have to have very sophisticated software. But this one here, that was they owned the 221B Baker Street thing. This took a long time to figure out who was owning certain properties in, uh, in the UK. So this, again, this is real data. OK, um, so we've got some pretty complex relationships there with a very simple graph model. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, Wilbur Ross. So he says he doesn't know anybody in Russia. But you know what? He does. So I won't leave that up there very long. But see, the kind of cool thing is, is how simple this query is. Basically, go find the people that have related to this kind of thing. So this is like stupidly simple to find this information. So how to do this and the queries for this, we actually have online. So you just, I'm not just making this up. You can actually do it. So um, you go explore it. This website here, we have sandboxes that are out there. So you can run these queries. But basically, you type in a name. It's like, OK, say you're looking for um, intentionally misspelled uh, uh, Michael Cohen and find out <laughs> some of the relationships that they have that are involved. So this is financial data. So we're going to be doing the same thing, but the, the lawyers are all like freaked out about uh, healthcare data. So, so that's going to take a while before we can publish any of that. So I, I won't go do this, but basically, this is why relational databases just haven't kept up. This is like when they created, this is what the state of the art was in terms of technology, in terms of telecommunications, uh, music deployment. This was an Uber ride back then when I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, life has changed, and that's how you store data. But why would you do a database that same way? That's what MySQL and that's what Oracle give you. They, they haven't really caught up, kept up with the trends. So it's basically they're, uh, how to do like complex queries in SQL Server versus how to do it in a graph database, because graphs are really all about relationships, being able to find people, that kind of thing. All right. OK, a couple of other things, yeah. A um, couple of other important things, like if you're going to use a database, use the right tool for the job. So this is uh, like th in the car analogy, insanely fast, but you know, it really doesn't turn. And then you've got the left turn, left turn, left turn, NASCAR kind of thing. We're kind of the Formula One team. Uh, we were used to this. You wouldn't use us to move your apartment from here to New York, but um, we're really good at being able to do a lot of very, I, I need agility. I need to build a, because a new legislation came in or a new director comes in, so I I've got this higher, higher priority. So being able to change direction on the fly is what, what graphs are for. So. Um, so when you're looking at like combinations, and this is real data too, so it's kind of fuzzy on purpose. But this is like looking at some of the concentrations of people that are. This is a healthcare provider that's really well connected um, for the wrong reasons. So being able to find these people and how many connections they have, the graph queries are out there. They're really pretty simple, and I'll show you a couple of them. But you don't need that one. Uh, you can run this on Spark, so you can run any analytics you want. It'll mold for parallelization, so you can run massively parallel uh, analysis. Um, again, using a Cypher query. So we just got selected, our query language got selected for Spark, for Spark 3.0. So now you have us for using your, your queries. A couple of other things, um, yeah, stuff. Public data sources, this is important. 
Arcos data set this out there. This is from the, the Washington Post, was able to get this via, via the uh, Freedom of Information Act. The problem with this is it's only geared towards the distribu distribution process. Okay, okay, one, one, one minute. Okay, one, one, thank you. We'll, we'll take it out of questions. Come by our booth, we'll, we'll answer questions. So, anyway, but this was basically on the pills themselves. What you want to do is you also want to take a look at some of the other ones. Like these are the, these are the prescriptions. Oh, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> See, I actually did have one more minute. So anyway, being able to, these are some of the data sets that are out there. But being able to piece them together is really pretty sophisticated to write the queries. Um, it's my job to help people do this. So we're helping the Washington Post do this, and hopefully we can help you guys figure this out. But a couple of data sets that are out there. This is the providers, how they're linked to one another. This is from the, uh, for, uh, this is from the, um, uh, the uh, I can't read it. Um, that's it. Cool. Thanks. Okay, okay. okay, sure. Uh, I have a question. On your graphic prompt, uh -huh. can you please uh, tell me how ARIA is related to Genji? How what? How ARIA is related to Genji? Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 